yeah the problem and uh, now we can start our yeah. webinar yeah i hope I that can you can see everyone. my slide yeah. okay so welcome to yeah. our yeah, webinar you, tonight among a series of webinars and educational activities sponsored by saudi german hospitals uh, group uh, I am Hassan Zahrani, um, Director of uh, Academic Affairs and Training in Saudi German Hospital Asir, Assistant Professor of Surgery in King Khalid University. Tonight, um, uh, our webinar is about uh, surgery for locally advanced and recurrent um, uh, rectal cancer. Our speakers today, from Germany, we have Professor Hans uh, Rodolf uh, Rapp, Professor Rab is a director of general and visceral surgery in Oldenburg Hospital, Germany, since 2002. He is a vice dean for the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences in Karol von uh, uh, Saski University since 2012. Professor Rab has a total experience of more than 25 years uh, in oncological surgery. Also, we have Dr. Yusuf Al Abdul Karim. Hopefully he is going to uh, join us uh, tonight. He is, uh, Dr. Abdul Karim is a fellowship trained in surgical oncology from Montreal, Canada, 2009. He served as a program director for general surgery in King Fahad Medical City from 2010 to 2016. Also as a head of colorectal surgery from 2016 to 2019. Dr. Abdul Karim has also experience of more than 10 years in oncological surgery. We have also uh, 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 panel members. We have Professor Wissam Al Gamri, Wissam Al Gamri from uh, Cairo, Egypt. He is a consultant, medical uh, oncology, Saudi German Hospital, Cairo. We have Dr. Ihab Saad. He is a general oncosurgery consultant, head of the surgery department of uh, Saudi German Hospital, Jeddah. And we have Dr. Nadim Maribari. He is assistant professor of surgery in King Abdulaziz University and working also in Saudi German Hospital Jeddah. Now, why we are talking about uh, colorectal cancer? Because it's the third most common cause of uh, cancer worldwide. And not only that, it's the second most common leading cause of death uh, among other cancers. In Saudi Arabia, it's the most common cancer in males, and it is the third most common cancer in females. So why rectal cancer? Because rectal cancer accounts for more than 40% of colorectal cancer cases in Saudi Arabia. And the local recurrence for lesions in the rectum is more than 30% as compared to the higher lesions in the colon. Not only that also, but the simultaneous achievement of the goals of cure and minimal impact of, uh, on quality of life, i.e. preserving continence and genital urinary function can be challenging in the uh, cases of rectal cancer. So, now, I would like to uh, invite our first speaker, Professor Rapp, to share his slides and talk to you uh, about this very important topic. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, Dr. Sarani. Oh, yes, you can share now. Yeah, I can. I can share now. No, this is wrong. Uh, moment. Doctor Rudolph. Yeah, I'm. I'm here. Now. Options. Yeah. My name is Rudolf Rapp. I'm from Germany, and uh, I'm a member of the visitors yeah, uh, program of Saudi. Pardon? of the Saudi German Hospital Group, now in Cairo and soon uh, in Saudi Arabia and later on in Dubai, I think. 
Uh, as you already heard, I'm a specialist in oncologic surgery, and I will give you a brief overview uh, of a surgery for locally advanced, um, um, advanced and recurrent rectal cancer. Just let me um, start with an overview of what I will go through. Um, these five points I will hope uh, I can enlighten for you and uh, start with the question how important the surgeon is. Modern therapy of uh, rectal cancer or colorectal cancer in general uh, needs a multidisciplinary team approach. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the relationship between the patient and the surgeon, I think, is the closest. There's an inner circle with a gastroenterologist and a medical oncologist and lots uh, of other people who um, help. It is um, it's a question how important is the surgeon and do the results uh, of a colorectal cancer surgery depend uh, on institutions or single surgeons. I have looked uh, for some data uh, in, from the era without adjuvant therapy where the only treatment was uh, surgical treatment. And you see here some uh, trials and the results of some trials in, uh, from this time. And if you look, you can see here for colon cancer that uh, five year survival differs enormous from 39 to 63%. Uh, and for rectal cancer, we can see the same picture. Uh, results differ from five-year survival of 19% in this uh, uh, English study to 48% in this Swedish study. Um, these are enormous differences. And this was even in Germany the same. Um, here, uh, seven maximum care uh, university hospitals. Um, and you can see these are all single institutions and the five-year survival rate differs here for rectal cancer from uh, roughly 52% uh, to 75%, uh, which is enormous, 50% uh, more in the best institution. And it's not only a difference for the inter institutions, uh, but you can see that in uh, some institutions, like Department A here, uh, there's no difference between single surgeons and uh, groups of surgeons uh, who do less than 15 operations a year. Uh, but look at this hospital, a big hospital with uh, uh, eight or nine surgeons doing more than 15 operations a year. Uh, but uh, the best has a local recurrence rate of 5% and the worst of over 50% in the same department. Same uh, thing we can see uh, with uh, five-year survival then. Uh, this means um, we have to look for the reasons of this, these differences. Also, um, an older study comparing two hospitals uh, who had one who joined one uh, or shared one pathologist. So it wasn't an effect of a pathologist that in one of the hospitals, clinic A, a tumor injury during surgery was 21%, in the other hospital only 2%. And uh, likewise, uh, local recurrence was over 50% in the bad hospital and only 16%, which is still very much uh, in the other hospital. And you can see the radicality of the operation was also in uh, clinic A uh, with uh, much few uh, lymph nodes compared to the other hospital uh, worse. And this is reflected in the five-year survival rate of 49% to 72% uh, in the uh, better hospital. So we can summarize these and other data, the data are legion in, uh, in that question, um, that the singular, the individual surgeon is the most important prognostic factor we can influence. There are factors we can't influence like a tumor stage, but the surgeon, we can influence the surgeon and what he's doing. And this is the most important factor we can influence. 
Um, so what shall we do? What can be done to improve the quality? What is good surgery in rectal cancer? Uh, at first, some principles. Surgery of rectal cancer is a surgery of lymph nodes, a surgery of radices, a surgery of safety distances, and surgery of border layers, and always, always, always a monoblock surgery. This is the same regardless of the surgical approach, uh, whether you do it laparoscopic or open, it uh, doesn't matter much. We do it laparoscopically in general today, but uh, this isn't the point of difference. The difference lies in the radicality. The operative technique is of importance. There we had a catchphrase of the last 20 or even 30 years, uh, which was TME, total uh, mesorectal excision. Um, this means that we, uh, on block, remove the entire connective tissue body behind uh, the rectum and in part around the rectum, the so-called mesorectum with its fascia. Um, this was made popular by Bill Heald in the 90s or beginning in the 80s um, uh, of last century, uh, who made uh, this sketch here. This is original from Bill Heald, uh, showing uh, that uh, you need to remove the entire mesorectum. Uh, nevertheless, Bill Heald didn't invent uh, this technique. It was invented from a German surgeon. Uh, called um, uh, Vestus, uh, already in 1934, uh, he um, took these uh, sketches in a book and showed that this was wrong and uh, this is the right way to operate rectal cancer. It needed uh, but uh, about 50 years uh, to come in, uh, in the brains of surgeons. <laughs> Uh, and Vesus uh, wrote it down uh, as well. He wrote in this book of 1934, uh, the cancer-infested area of lymph glands is removed as a cohesive unit together with the bowel. No doubt what he meant. Um, but it's not essential that the mesorectum is completely removed. It is important also how we do it. And there, I have to say, uh, still many surgeons doing blunt dissection with their hands or using clamps in the small pelvis. This is disastrous. Uh, you have a risk of bleeding, injury to the autonomic nerve system, and uh, you are not radical enough, uh, a risk to tear the tumor and to produce local uh, recurrences. You should avoid this. I and uh, don't want to say much about uh, the special technique, but uh, I uh, would emphasize to use instruments like this, bipolar sealing instruments. They can cut as well, um, and you can use them for laparoscopic or open surgery as well. And this is modern surgery without clamps, without clips, without anything, just bipolar sealing the vessels. Now we're coming closer to the locally advanced rectal tumors. Um, and especially there, it applies that TME alone is not sufficient. It is necessary, but not sufficient. TME has to be understood as a synonym for a standardized radical surgery, resection of the tumor, the lymph nodes, radices, borderline layers, uh, and if necessary the neighboring, neighboring organs as well. I show you examples uh, later uh, in an en bloc standardized technique. In most cases today uh, laparoscopically, but this is not the crucial point as I mentioned already. And let me say another thing which isn't in all heads already. Uh, all rectal or primary rectal carcinomas are resectable. I never saw one which wasn't. There might be patients who are from the general condition not suitable for surgery. There might be cases where radical surgery makes no sense 
this are only very few, for sure less than 0.5%. And there are cases, more and more cases. Uh, I will um, go there in a greater detail later uh, for a watch and wait approach. But there is no such thing like technical unresectability. If you see a patient like this, send it to me, uh, send him to me. Uh, I never saw uh, something like this. Uh, there are reasons be uh, uh, for which we have to resect the primary, even if it's uh, not an RCR resection because of a metastasis, for instance. Um, a lot of reasons. The most important reason is that if we don't do the resection, it is particularly unfavorable for the quality of life because of pain, bleeding, fistula, gangrene, cloaca. I show you one example, a perineal acute affection of a rectal carcinoma. This, uh, this patient was uh, in another hospital and they took only uh, a probe uh, of the tumor and uh, let this be. Uh, you can imagine what this mean for the patient or the quality of life of this patient. Um, therefore, I operated on him and he wasn't curable. He had a severe carcinomatosis of uh, um, the peritone uh, peritoneum and um, of the omentum, but it wasn't, un the primary wasn't unresectable, still wasn't unresectable. I did an extent extended extirpation of the rectum uh, post-operative chemotherapy and that patient uh, lived for two years and four months. And what's most important in a better quality of life than he uh, would have had uh, with the tumor in place. He lived longer than he would have lived with the tumor, but uh, important is that he lived better. Therefore, always remove the primary tumor. And then there's a question uh, about sphincter preservation. In about more than 85%, we can preserve the sphincter today. Uh, if we can go down to the dentate line with the resection and uh, still remove um, the entire mesorectum. Um, the lower we come with the resection, uh, the less uh, safety distance we can accept, uh, one centimeter or even less if we dissect here along the dentate line. Uh, dentate line. Uh, problem is um, that this has always uh, implications for continence because the rectal ampulla is part of the continence organ and you have uh, to face uh, um, functional disturbances even if you can uh, preserve the sphincter or most of the sphincter. Um, but sphincter preservation can be made more easy if you do the neoadjuvant uh, therapy. You can see here the results. Um, this one, uh, this uh, patient's sphincter wasn't endangered, um, but uh, this was a resection along the dentate line. And uh, both were huge tumors at first and shrunk. Um, dramatically by the neoadjuvant radiochemotherapy. You can see here uh, the results, uh, what radiochemotherapy can do. And we have now uh, way, found ways how we can improve even this. Uh, and all I said applies also for T4 tumors. We have here a lady with an infiltration of rectal cancer into um, the uterus. Um, you can do en bloc resections with other organs um, like the uterus here and the total mesorectum, but still preserves the sphincter. This was with preserva preservation of the anal sphincter. This is another lady 
uh, with infiltration of the vagina. You can see here the rectum. Uh, and here, this is the vagina. Uh, most of the vagina had to be um, rejected. Uh, but you see the tumor was grown through the rectal wall, through the vaginal wall, into the vagina. And uh, this is not allowed uh, to do in pieces. You have to, uh, this is a good example, that we have to do a monoblock resection. But still no need in that case to do a rectal extirpation. Another case, a young man here with a T4 tumor infiltrating the bladder. Uh, you can see here on the lower picture uh, the opened bladder of the specimen and um, down here the tumor infiltration. Uh, again, a monoblock resection. Again, all the mesorectum, all the lymph nodes, the vessels in place. Um, here the uh, catheter uh, of the bladder, but again, a case where we, despite this advanced tumor, could preserve the sphincter. Uh, and sphincter preservation was also possible in this case. It's an unusual rectal cancer, uh, a huge one, uh, T4 rectal cancer with infiltration of the vagina, the uterus, and, uh, and other organs but it was a T4 N0 tumor. No lymph node metastasis, no distant metastasis. You see this sometimes that uh, erectile cancer isn't, um, it isn't possible for erectile cancer to metastasize and therefore it can grow to a large extent without metastasizing even the lymph nodes. And these uh, tumors have a good prognosis, but you must remove them. And in that case, also uh, um, could be removed with preservation of the sphincter. So if we do so, standardized radical surgery also, and especially for the locally advanced rectal cancer, uh, we can achieve a local recurrence rate of 5% or less. Our um, uh, rate is 2 to 3%. So the question is, if we can achieve this with surgery alone, do we still need neoadjuvant therapy? Answer is yes, we do, because surgery has no influence on distant metastasis as a first event. No, the local recurrence rate can still be improved, even after excellent surgery. We made uh, trials where we could show this. And uh, the rate of sphincter preservation is higher after neoadjuvant therapy. And this, the neoadjuvant therapy, I'm going to tell you uh, soon about this, is the only way to a watch and wait approach uh, if a complete, a clinical complete remission uh, can be achieved. But another but, adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy cannot compensate for unradical or otherwise bad surgery. We need it, but it is not to compensate uh, for bad surgeries. But watch and wait approach uh, is a question. What shall we do if we see a complete, uh, clinically a complete um, uh, remission of the tumor after new adventure chemotherapy? Um, can be wait and watch? Answer is probably yes. This is, uh, these are early data from uh, already eight years old. We see that uh, local recurrence rate is lower in those patients uh, with uh, complete remission. The distant metastases are fewer. The disease-free survival is better in these patients with a complete remission. The overall survival is also better in most of these studies. Um, the first who did this was Angelita Bergama from Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, she published this already in 2004, a study with neoadjuvant therapy with and without surgery. She compared this 
uh, it was not it was not really a randomized study and many people didn't believe the results um, but the, the results were impressive in summary i cannot go into the details because of the time now uh, but in summary i can say uh, organ preservation after one year was 57 percent of all her rectal cancers and uh, despite many of the colleagues didn't believe it uh, i had my doubts uh, then uh, also i must say um, but uh, as early as uh, 2005, uh, Michael Myers wrote in an editorial of the Annals of Surgical Oncology, um, rectal cancer can we throw away the scalpel? No operation at all. This was a new question. And now, even for 15 years later, we haven't reached this point yet. But I must say we are approaching it for uh, hopefully many patients. Uh, I show you some uh, brand new data from the, this year's uh, ASCO. Um, the meeting was completely online. This is a yearly meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And there are, were three trials shown to um, phase three and one phase two, uh, randomized phase two trial, uh, which are, I think, really game changing. This is the biggest, perhaps the most important one, the RAPIDO trial. Um, I can go into the details, but they compared uh, standard uh, therapy, radio chemotherapy over five weeks. Um, with uh, an, as, uh, five times five gray, um, followed by prolonged uh, chemotherapy and operation later uh, than uh, we did up to now. And they could show that they, has, uh, they had with um, this procedure, with, which is called TNT, total new advanced therapies, not really uh, the right uh, name for it because uh, some patients got uh, post-operative chemotherapy as well, but most of the treatment was pre-operatively and they could show 7% uh, lower dis disease-related uh, treatment failure, uh, lower distant metastasis rate, uh, and a doubled PCR rate. This was a PCR, not a CCR, because all patients were operated in the study. Uh, it was doubled from 14 to uh, 28%, and this was pathologically uh, confirmed. Three year overall survival rate was brilliant in both treatment groups. Um, and this is um, in, in another study from France, the Prodigy uh, trial, they compared also the standard treatment now uh, with a prolonged uh, so-called TNT, total new advanced therapy arm, uh, not with five times five grades, but with a standard uh, uh, therapy with uh, 50 point per four gray over five weeks. I think this isn't important whether you give five times five or uh, a radio therapy over five weeks. Um, and they could show nearly the same. They doubled um, the PCR rate also from 12 to, um, to 28%. So we can say TNT, total new urgent therapy, roughly doubles CCR rates, and in these studies, PCR rates even. Um, I think this will, as soon as uh, these papers are published, um, as, an, as an entire paper, uh, will be the new standard for advanced rectal cancer. That all patients will be treated longer and with more chemotherapy before the operation. There was another the third uh, study, was the OPRA study. This was the first um, with organ preservation 
as uh, a primary goal. And the question was how many patients can, um, can be, um, for how many patients we can preserve the organ. Um, organ preservation is, um, I think, a synonym for, for surgeon free uh, survival. And in this trial, they had a historic control arm and uh, two arms with uh, um, one arm radiotherapy first and the other arm later. Um, and they con could show that compared to the historic control, um, they had organ preservation rates in the best arm of uh, 59, nearly 60%. Uh, which is uh, sensational as well. These three studies are so important that I thought, uh, even um, despite I'm a, I'm a surgeon, I um, should show these to you uh, because they open a really great door to the watch and wait approach, uh, which we have to face now. Uh, whether we do this we cannot do this without further trials, but uh, the door is open and I have no doubts that we all will go through this door, uh, through this gate uh, within the next years. What's about local recurrences? How to deal with these? I think the best way to treat a local recurrence is, as I already mentioned, to avoid it an optimal primary operation. This is by far the best way, uh, but not by leaving the primary tumor in place. You can also avoid local recurrences by doing this, but this is the wrong way. Uh, the recurrence, if there's a recurrence, the only curative option is a radical R0 re-resection. You cannot try this and that button in these cases. You have, or the patient has only one chance. There are some more surgical problems than in primary tumors. We have destroyed boundary layers, uh, severe adhesions, uh, very often uh, infiltration of the neighboring structures. Um, and so on, and the assessment of our zero resectability is difficult, uh, often only possible if there's no uh, way to go back if you cross the point of no return already. Um, I show you some cases from easy to um, severe. This is an anastomotic recurrence, the uh, radical anterior re resection was possible in this case. This was easy because he is a patient wasn't radically resected in the first approach. You can see all the lymph nodes are st were still in place. Um, as you see from the different colors where the anastomosis is, and this is a classical anastomotic um, recurrence. Uh, this is also an anastomotic recurrence, but it needed a pelvic exenteration by contrast to that case. The tumor, the recurrence was uh, bigger and infiltrated the bladder. And you can see this is a typical uh, aspect of these uh, recurrences. You cannot say uh, clinically where the tumor ends and where the fibrosis begins. This is the open bladder that is divided in two parts here in the specimen, and you can see it down here, the rectum also opened, and all this is recurrent tumor. The only chance is a pelvic exenteration in these cases. You can, if you try to go uh, that way to uh, keep the bladder in place, then this is disastrous. You are not allowed to do this. Uh, another typical case, a tumor, a recurrent tumor infiltrating bladder, sacrum, and the small bowel, um, quite a typical case. And uh, it doesn't look so big, but you have still to do a major operation. 
uh, with a secular section, the section of uh, part of the small bowel and of the bladder. You see here's the bladder, the severe fibrosis um, as well. This is from behind the um, sacral bone. Uh, this is from the abdominal view um, the specimen. Uh, you can see still a monoblock resection. But this is uh, something like a standard intervention uh, for local recurrences. Uh, another example here, um, whether this is uh, an anastomotic recurrence or not, you can say, uh, and you can say where the tumor ends and the fibrosis begins, always the bladder uh, was thickened like this. These are always the same pictures. Uh, and the pictures also after the operation, the pictures are also the same. You have uh, to remove uh, all tissue from the small, small pelvis. Here you look um, from uh, in all these pictures, except uh, um, that one on the right side, um, you um, look into the small pelvis, you, you see um, the operator nerve, the left one, here's the right uh, operator nerve, and the aorta here, um, iliac artery and iliac vein, uh, all denuded. And here you can see on the um, lower right picture also dissection of the internal iliac arteries and veins. You have to remove all these tissue and you have big holes afterwards. This is a picture from behind. This was a patient also with infiltration of the tumor in the vagina. And afterwards we have to do plastic reconstructions. In that case, uh, gluteus uh, muscle, advancement muscle clap. Uh, she is now more than 14 years free of recurrence. Um, another case with an exalceration, uh, perineal uh, alteration with uh, cloaca formation, uh, you can see in that case again, uh, or you can imagine what this means for quality of life of this patient, tumor infiltrated, infiltrated here the bladder and here the lower sacral bone, uh, and this is all a tumor on the CT scan and uh, you see the exaggeration. Uh, I removed this in total um, with again a big hole uh, and we had to reconstruct this patient uh, with a free latissimus dorsi flap. This is the patient uh, three and a half years after the operation um, he was uh, with a very good result. Uh, no recurrence, unfortunately, uh, he died five and a half years after the operation from a heart attack, but free of uh, tumor. And if we do so, uh, we can achieve long time survival uh, for those we can auxiliary resect uh, in about a third of cases. Uh, and we have uh, distant metastasis in two thirds uh, as a first event and a, no, a new uh, local recurrence uh, as a first event, uh, also in about a third of cases. This compares well with the literature where we have uh, figures from uh, widespread from 8 to 52 percent, but uh, in the uh, mean it's around a third of patients with long time survival. Yeah, where are the frontiers or where are the frontiers crossed? Uh, sometimes I did uh, more than I showed you already. Um, according to Shakespeare, that uh, disease is desperate grown only by desperate appliance uh, could be relieved or not at all. And um, so I did operations like this with ultra extended lymph node extirpation. You see here uh, cable vein uh, order. Um, this is um, the uh, upper mesenteric artery here, uh, lymph, uh, and there's the pancreas, and uh, we did a total lymph adenectomy. Um, patient uh, survived, but it wasn't uh, really easy. Another case of a pelvic accentuation with a uh, very, very extended um, 
extirpation of tissue and lymph nodes. Uh, another case here with a double Y prosthesis where we resected uh, the lower part of aorta and uh, cable vein with uh, iliac veins and arteries and it's a stubble uh, prosthesis. Um, or in that case, uh, this is all recurrent tumor here on the T CT scan, the pelvis was uh, completely filled with this tumor and the tumor exulcerated here in the bowel wall, uh, close to uh, his stoma and he had another exulceration uh, in perineal uh, this was a 25 hours operation, but it was possible to remove all the tumor. And uh, this is uh, something I uh, wouldn't do, wouldn't like to do so often. A total sacrectomy for a uh, sacrum which was totally infiltrated by the tumor. Uh, if you do this, you need a stabilization with uh, many uh, metal uh, pieces uh, just to stabilize the spine. Uh, this patient was after the operation more than three months uh, uh, in the hospital and uh, despite all efforts, they she um, got a re recurrence uh, after nine or, or 10 months and died after one and a half year after this operation. It wasn't uh, really encouraging to do this uh, again because she was long in the hospital because she got an infection here um, in, um, in this area. And therefore uh, she hadn't really a profit of this operation. Um, what are, I haven't got take home messages for you, but stay at home messages because this is a webinar. Um, what are my stay at home messages for you? Uh, what I wanted to say is surgery, surgical technique is still, despite all other developments, a decisive factor in rapid cancer therapy. Healing depends still on the single surgeon. Be careful if you've got a rectal cancer, be careful with uh, choosing your surgeon. Healing is possible also in advanced and also in metastatic cases. I didn't mention um, um, surgery of metastasis, um, liver metastasis or lung metastasis. You can do this next time. Uh, technical unresectability does not exist. Sphincter preservation is possible for the vast majority of patients. Your advent treatment is no substitute for good surgeries. Uh, important to remember this. Nevertheless, therapy is more and more multidisciplinary uh, for rectal cancer and TNT is for sure the future because it brings more CCRs complete remissions, less local recurrences, and therefore chances for organ preservation, and uh, which means a chance to avoid surgery at all. If local recurrence still occurs, we have surgical methods, methods to treat this as I've shown you. Now I come to an end. Uh, we'll thank you for your attention and show you uh, to the end a few impressions from my hometown. If you would like to uh, visit Oldenburg, do it in May or June, then you have all these uh, flowering uh, rhododendrons uh, and um, something else which is nice to see. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Rapp. Thank you very much, Professor Rapp, for your comprehensive and informative presentation on locally advanced recurrent rectal cancer and for the clinical cases uh, presented. So uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions, but since we are behind the schedule, we'll try to keep them at the end of this webinar. Now, please allow me to invite Dr. Al Abdul Karim to present his part in this webinar, which is about atypical rectal cancers. Dr. Abdul Karim. Yeah. 
you can start sharing your slide, Dr. Al Abdul Karim. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Yusuf. Oh, okay. Great. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum uh, salam wa rahmatullah. Let, uh, let me share with you how much I appreciate the state of art presentation of Professor Rab. It's very enjoyable. And um, um, I would like also to apologize for, for the uh, technical difficulties that I had in the beginning. I'm going to try to share my uh, slides in a few seconds. If you bear with me, please. Take your time. Do you have any technical issues, Dr. Yusuf? Uh, I'm just trying to get it on. OK. You have to pre-open it in your computer. Then you hit on the share screen in the bottom of your uh, sure. laptop screen. I'm on the phone, actually, calling you from the phone. OK. Uh, Dr. Hassan, could we take some question until uh, Dr. Yusuf be ready with this? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm going to as soon as I get the. Uh... Okay, since, yeah, yeah. okay, okay, we'll, we'll okay. give you the time. Dr. And Dr. Okay. Rehab, please go ahead and take questions. And uh, the uh, floor is open for your uh, for your discussion. Please go ahead, Dr. Rehab. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Professor Hans. It was a very nice and fruitful presentation. Actually, I'm very impressed by, uh, by the, I believe this is a new theme he, he's trying to deliver, which is, I believe that the title of this presentation, if I'm trying to give a title, but it will be, uh, there is no stop in rectal cancer for a surgeon. That's right, Dr. Hans. Unmute your microphone, Dr. Hans. Yes. What, what was the question? Uh, I, I, I first, I'd like to thank you. It's me, Dr. Rehab Saad. I'm assistant professor of National Cancer Institute, Cairo University. I'm a an, uh, surgical oncologist uh, in the Saudi uh, German uh, hostel in Gadda, the head of the Department of Surgical and uh, Oncosurgery. I believe that if I'm going to give a title, I, at first, I'd like to thank you about this fruitful, nice presentation. Actually, I was very impressed about the technicality, the high technicality and the, the cases that you showed. If I'm going to uh, give a title for that extraordinary presentation, it will be, uh, there is no stop for uh, a, a cancer, uh, for a surger, surgery for rectal cancer. Is that right? You're right. There is no stop and there will never be a stop, I think. Uh, not, okay. in, not during so, our lives, uh, but, uh, but we have to face new developments. Uh, like yes. TNT and what we do after TNT is another question. 
whether to yes. operate if the patient has a complete re remission or to do watch and wait approach. There is much more uh, work needed okay. to, to make okay. trials. So, so, so let me take you from this point. There is no technical, what we are calling technically resectable rectal cancer. Yes. Okay. What, what about those locally advanced rectal cancers that infiltrate the sacrum? You present in your, in your last presentation the case of sacrectomy. I, I, I'm, I'm very curious about to know what, how, how it was in the post-operative period. What about the continency? How did you preserve the nerve? Uh, does she uh, was continent or incontinent? And what, what about her pain post-operative period? Yeah, if you do a sacral resection, then you cannot preserve the sphincter. Or if you do, it, wasn't, uh, it, would, it wouldn't function. These cases with sacral resection need a permanent uh, uh, colostomy. Uh, what about you? Your inoculation, she's she can control the, 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 the urination to, yeah. to to remove the full the full sacrum first and first, first and second sacral pieces. Yeah, actually, does it affect the continency for? So uh, these patients couldn't be continent. Uh, this is impossible to be continent after sacral resection because the nerves uh, are gone then. The, these so, patients need a colostomy. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm talking about urinary, urinary continency. A urinary, yeah. Uh, mostly the, these patients have uh, got uh, um, a total pelvic accentuation, which means that the bladder is all also gone. And they- uh, So we're talking about two, two stomas. Two, two divergent, two, two divergence. Two divergence, yeah. I, I, I could show you a picture, this is possible. Yeah, please, please. Uh, let's, let me, uh, I've got a picture to show, just a, uh, just a moment. So uh, if you are going to, if you are I going to- I can show so you, uh, I can show, I got a picture, but uh, I cannot show all pictures, therefore, um, it was, uh, yeah, in my institute, we used to do a, sacrectomy, but yeah, two stomas. Is, yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can see it, two stomas. Two stomas. And, uh, yeah. This was a young man. This was a young man, and he's still alive uh, after uh, more than ten years, and he lives quite well with the two stomas. This is uh, not what we all would wish, but it's better than to die from uh, uh, rectal cancer or rectal yeah. cancer recurrence. Okay. Yeah. In, in my institute, we used to do a secretion bar, but for the lower three segments of the sacrum, we didn't yeah, okay. dare to, to resect the first and second piece of segment. Uh, my, my, my second question, do you, do, you, do you experience or do you, do you try the intraoperative radiotherapy post, to the, post to this kind yeah. of uh, radical resection? If, does it work with you? Uh, I never had a uh, possibility to do this, but there uh, there is one um, study from Aachen, a German town in, in the west of Germany, a few years ago with, with about 100 patients uh, who got uh, removal of recurrent rectal cancer plus uh, intraoperative radiotherapy with no effect on uh, whether you did it or not hadn't an effect in that small study with only uh, 100 patients. But it's, uh, it's quite difficult to do this intraoperative radio chemotherapy. And I was, uh, in former years, I was in uh, Hanover Medical School. And when I worked there, we had also no possibility to, to uh, radiate intraoperatively. Okay. Therefore, you we didn't do this. And most of these patients already had uh, 55 or 60 or even 70 uh, gray, and it's difficult to give more uh, radiation than uh, to the small pelvis, uh, and the bone will uh, not be thankful for this. Okay. One of your cases you presented with a rectal cancer with a peritoneal disease. 
yeah. uh, do, do, do you use to, uh, you know, you, you mentioned Project 3223, you know, of course, you know about Project 7. Uh, do you believe in hypic in this kind of the disease? If you have a recurrent yeah. rectal disease or peritoneal disease, did you yeah. experience yeah. that before? We do hypex in those cases, but not, not in exactly those cases. We measure the PCI and, uh, you know, the PCI, uh, you can uh, have um, 39 points and uh, we only do hypex uh, with a maximum of 20 points. Should be 20 or below 20. Oh, or 18, yeah. I think this patient was close to 39, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this, this is what I'm saying, yeah. Even in, in, in rectum, some, some studies of some center recommend just PCI, not more than 12. Yeah, to, to, to we would to say the... not more than 20, yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I, I have a lot okay. of questions from the audience, okay. but I want to leave the floor. If, if yes, uh, the thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rab. Thank you, Dr. Ihab. I think Dr. Yusuf is ready for his presentation now. Now we'll start sharing his uh, presentation. Okay. Um, do you hear me now? Yes, please. Go ahead. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying uh, because of the pressure of the time. So bear with me, please. I'm trying to uh, uh, speak about the atypical kinds of, of malignancy that affects the rectum. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we're going to talk, uh, there are few actually that I'm, I'm, I'm skipping, but we're going only to speak about uh, the uh, most common of the un uh, or the atypical kinds of, uh, of malignancies. Next, please. So uh, the uh, uh, the uh, carcinoid tumors or the uh, NIT actually during the endocrine tumors uh, is one of the uh, types that we actually encounter every now and then in the rectum. Uh, however, though they are rare tumors, and when I say rare, they are rare. Uh, you, you probably you'll spend uh, many years before you have your first uh, carcinoid in the rectum as a primary site. Uh, unless, of course, if you have a very uh, famous uh, uh, referral center that probably they will send all these cases to you, then it's a different situation. So in general, the, the uh, neuroendocrine tumors uh, probably uh, 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 comprises about 20 to 25 percent of all the gastrointestinal uh, uh, malignancies, and uh, they can be found in the rectum is probably in a very uh, uh, rare, uh, uh, you know, occasions. Uh, of all the malignancies of the rectum, it around, it's around it's about 1%. And in the recent studies, it's even less than that, between 0.2 to 0.6%. Per, um, according to the you know, usual uh, uh, presentation, you'll find probably uh, your patients to be either of African origin or Asian origin rather than Caucasians. And um, uh, presumably, they, there are some uh, predominant uh, uh, in women rather than in men, although recently we found that probably it is equal in both uh, sexes. The typical for neuroendocrine tumors is to present in the sixth de decade, but uh, strangely, when they present in the, in the, in the uh, rectal area, they present a little bit earlier, usually in the fifth decade. Next, please. So, um, the clinical presentation uh, is usually asymptomatic, and that's what makes it a little bit uh, peculiar or difficult to, to, to uh, uh, diagnose uh, in early stage. Uh, they probably half of the patients who uh, come is usually they are asymptomatic, and you'll find that most of the time they will be picked up by, uh, by uh, diagnostic uh, routine uh, uh, in uh, colonoscopy rather than uh, being diagnosed and referred. When they have symptoms, usually it's it's very also nonspecific. Most of the time, it's discomfort, uh, uh, feeling of uh, tenesmus, uh, bleeding, or constipation. Anything that's probably you will think of if there is a rotation of the rectal region. But when they have the symptoms that are specific, like the carcinoid syndrome, usually it's less than five percent of all the cases, and they usually 
uh, are a bad sign. And they usually present uh, with metastasis. That's why they present with the uh, classical uh, carcinoid syndrome presentation. Next. The uh, usual workup is as usual, is the uh, laboratory workup and the uh, 5-HIAA is usually the thing that we request. And it is the, usually the recommendation of both the North American neuroendocrine uh, tumors and even the European uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumor society. They have usually this as a standard. The chromogranin A uh, is also recommended by North American uh, society. Uh, as a routine, as a serum, and uh, sorry, from the serum, and also as a workup from the uh, histopathology itself. Uh, invariably, you will find the patients having uh, raised uh, CA and sometimes the uh, prostatic specific antigens, but as usually, the ESR are uh, quite non specific and you can find them elevated without any specificity of the disease itself. Next, please. And the workup usually we start, as we said, most of the time they will come to you after being scanned by, by colonoscopy as a routine investigation, either because of the age or for any other uh, reason or because of the symptoms that's not very common. And they find these uh, uh, tumors. Um, and if you have very good, uh, you know, endoscopist, I think they most of the time they tend to go for, from colonoscopy to EOS in the same time, just to make sure that they, they finish the workup instead of doing it in two sessions. So the endoscopic ultrasound will help us in uh, characterizing it to more, more uh, probably precise and also looking for the invasion and the thickness and the, if there is any uh, uh, you know extension to the outside organs. MRI is very useful, CT scan is also useful, but probably in, in our institute, we prefer to do MRI for all these cases just to delineate the, the structures and make sure that we don't miss a uh, meta, uh, recent, you know, a local invasion or uh, local uh, extension. The octreotide scan is usually practiced for many of the people when, when they have uh, neuroendocrine tumors, but particularly for rectal tumors. We don't find them very useful uh, in most of the cases. And that's why, you know, when, when you look for, for most of the authorities, uh, Despite the rarity of the disease, they, you don't find the octreotide as part of, of the, of the uh, workup for the rectal uh, carcinoids or the neuroendocrine tumors. Next, please. And this is the staging. And, uh, you know, the staging uh, is something that's probably uh, uh, quite uh, useful uh, for, for probably prognostic uh, purposes. Next, please. The treatment. So as uh, the professor said earlier, I mean, uh, we are not biased for surgical intervention all the time. But however, though, we know that up till now, the surgery is main uh, stem of most of the treatments of the rectal disease. And the neuroendocrine tumor is no exception. However, though, because of the advancement in the endoscopic and the advances of uh, new machines, some of the small, tiny uh, neuroendocrine tumors in the rectum can be, you know, removed, resected uh, by endoscopy with the very uh, encouraging results. If the margins are free and if the size is reasonable, uh, you find that it is easy to remove them without any uh, difficulties. The surgical resection usually goes with, with the size. If it's less than two centimeters, usually, if you remember what our, you know, uh, usual technique with the appendix, it's more or less the same. When it's less than two centimeters, you're always a good news usually. You resect it, you have nice margins, and you, you send it, and the patients usually have no problems later on. But between, uh, sorry, one centimeter, between one to two centimeters, there is a lot of controversy between the authorities. Some people like to go for more radical uh, resection, and uh, some people would like to go for regular resection and probably for multidisciplinary approach. However, though, if it's more than two centimeters, definitely it uh, uh, calls for definite surgery and probably uh, more margins and care. And that's also might, you know, depend on other factors like the grade of the disease, despite the size. Grade is also important. However, though, margin is also uh, useful in these cases. Next, please. 
And um, as you know, most of the time, uh, you find people talking about neuroendocrine lesions or tumors, but, but when it is more than, uh, 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 you know, when it is more than uh, 20 uh, uh, mitotic activity, uh, you find that, and the differentiation in the grade is poor, uh, most of the people would like to probably to call it more of carcinoma rather than just a tumor. Next, please. So in a proper setting, the, the, uh, the usual things that we need to report, and probably we uh, always insist on, on having in the final report, is the tumor size, the depth of invasion, the margin, the tumor grade uh, differentiation. Uh, lymphovascular invasion plays an important role in the, in the uh, prognostic you know, staging of the patient. Uh, lymph node involvement, which is not very common, but however, though, when they are there, usually they, they can probably be more of uh, bad prognostic criteria and the location, of course. Next, please. The uh, next uh, topic is the primary colorectal lymphomas, which uh, usually uh, not very common also. However, though, when they present, they present about 10% uh, uh, of all lymphomas. And in colorectal, also, it's about 1% of all the rectal tumors that uh, uh, that's not uncommon. However, though, it's, it's there. And uh, in, in many situations, we'll find them more often than the neuroendocrine tumors. They usually of the non-Hodgkin types, and they are of B cell. However, though, uh, T cell have been also mentioned, and all the var other variants have been mentioned in the uh, oriental areas like China and Korea. and uh, um, when, if you ask me why is this uh, the case, it's different from the west to the east, uh, I would uh, say the same thing. Don't ask me, ask China. The uh, male to female ratio is about two to 1%, and the age is also around uh, 50, uh, 50s, usually they present in the 50s of the age. The clinical presentation also is usually insidious, and most of the time they don't present with a clear uh, presentation, so they present with abdominal pain most of the time, more than 50% of the cases. Weight loss is quite common, and uh, palpable abdominal mass is uh, all uh, presentation that you might see a patient with lymphoma. Hematochesia do happen, and uh, the worst condition when you have a patient uh, with perforation, either on treatment or directly coming from the emergency room with you know, perforation and signs of peritonitis. Uh, weight loss, as I said earlier, is uh, uh, a sign that can be mistaken, especially in our Middle East regions. It is very easily mistaken for, for uh, TB patients. And I always remind uh, the, our students and residents that you cannot take uh, TB from the differential diagnosis, especially in our areas, despite the fact that uh, TB is growing in even uh, the, the uh, North American countries and other countries. So. Always keep in mind that we've seen very sad stories of patients being treated as lymphoma and they, by the end they found to be only TB or vice versa. So always put it in mind and try to remove it from your differential before you go and embark on the patient. Uh, this, they differ from the usual lymphomas. They don't present with the usual presentation like lymphoma patients. So you might find that the night switch and the fever uh, the low-grade, uh, long-term fever is not always the case in them. Uh, so uh, don't be surprised if your patient is a lymphoma patient despite he doesn't have these symptoms. Next, please. Uh, the triggers that we usually talk about, like immune suppression, HIV, transplantation, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, they actually been always mentioned in many you know, studies, but up till now, we don't have an evidence uh, that connect them in a proper way. And I don't think they have anything to do with the uh, rectal uh, lymphomas. Next, please. Uh, investigation also, typically we go for CT scan and you find that the, it is probably the best uh, investigation of choice. And one of its beauties is you can do it, do it even on, on uh, Emergency situations like the, those who come with perforation, a CT scan is safe. And if the patient a condition uh, is okay, you find that it is easy for them to go and do CT scan before you do anything else. 
they might present as a mass lesion. Uh, they might present with narrowing of the lumen, which is quite characteristic for, for lymphoma. And sometimes they present with regional lymph nodes. In the lab investigation that uh, you'll not find the typical kind of lymphoma that you usually see in the systemic lymphoma. And most of the time the labs are surprisingly normal. <clears throat> Next. And that's why uh, Dawson and uh, his team uh, came up with the guidelines since the 60s of, of the last century. Uh, it is quite clear that in these particular patients with GI colorectal lymphoma, they present with no peripheral lymphadenopathy most of the time. They usually have uh, absent or uh, no uh, mediastinal uh, uh, lymph node enlargement. The white cell count usually is about within normal limits. And uh, primary involvement of the bowel was only proximal uh, rather than with, with proximal rather than systemic lymphadenopathy. The lack of the involvement of liver and spleen is usual. And from there, if you apply these criteria, it might help you in uh, making sure that you're dealing with the right disease rather than missing a systemic lymphoma that's uh, not been diagnosed properly. Uh, the colonoscopy, uh, they usually can be done in, in uh, routine cases rather than in emergency cases, but you'll find probably a typical ulceration or infiltration with mass lesion. And the waves usually is very feasible and is uh, quite informative. Next, please. The uh, histopathology, as we said earlier, it's uh, non-Hodgkin's usually, and uh, it's mostly predominantly of, uh, of B cell type. The evaluation of CD20 is typically there. And other markers can be also obtained from the histopathology results. Next, please. And this is the usual uh, staging of lymphoma. It applies also for, for the rectal or the colorectal uh, primary lymphoma. Next, please. Management um, here is usually a combined. It, have to, it has to go through a multidisciplinary approach. The best outcomes usually comes when you combine surgery with adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. Uh, and there is an evidence that the survival also goes side by side with, with the combined treatment rather than surgical versus chemotherapy alone. Uh, the, uh, the usual technique is to use the CHOP uh, regimen or the most recent uh, RCHOP regimen adding the, the, uh, the retixo, rituximab to the, to, to the, uh, to the regimen. Uh, and there is an evidence of improved survival rate on these uh, cases. The goals of the surgery, next, is uh, usually uh, either one of these. I mean, if we're not looking for, for a curative intent in early stage, and as we said earlier, combined management, the, palliate, the, the surgery can be done for, for palliation, for uh, prevention of tumor complication, like as we said, bleeding or perforation, uh, to provide a, a proper local control if, if it doesn't, uh, uh, it cannot be uh, you know, achieved with chemotherapy alone. And uh, sometimes it can be only the definitive therapy if everything fails. And uh, the survival, unfortunately, doesn't go with the surgical intervention. Despite whatever you do, the survival is a little bit independent and it has to be a multidisciplinary approach. Next, please. Um, I'm presenting this actually not for you to suffer reading it, but uh, this is a very nice kind of, of retrieval of all the data uh, in, in the uh, national database in the uh, United States since uh, the 90s till 2016. And unfortunately, what we see is very variable way of treat the treatment and the protocols that has been used for each stage which makes you think that despite the fact that we think uh, lymphoma is an easy disease, most of the time the treatment is not. And uh, many people will go for different, you know, uh, different managements before they come up with, with uh, the proper one. So I think if, if you are not faced with an emergency situation, multidisciplinary approach, as we always say, is the, the way or the state of art uh, type of treatment. Next, please. Uh, the disadvantages of surgery is usually associated with high morbidity because the disease 
deplete the patient and usually they, they don't have good reserve. And sometimes the surgery itself is very difficult. Uh, the, some, if it's already a systemic disease, it fails to, to address the systemic part of the disease. And the extent of surgery is variable. Some, some people, uh, most of the authorities like to go for, for local uh, combined with chemotherapy rather than radical treatment. And up till now, we don't have any uh, strong evidence that the radical surgery is uh, better than the local with, with, uh, combined with chemotherapy. <clears throat> Prognosis, uh, usually unfavorable, unfortunately. And mind you that most of these patients, they come in advanced age. And the, uh, the only thing that we, we know that ladies usually do better than men like usually. Next, please. They're just tumors. Uh, quickly, we're just uh, going to speak about uh, them uh, as part of the exceedingly rare diseases. Uh, usually, uh, definitely less than 1% of all just tumors, they can occur in the colorectal. Mind you, they are rare in, to start with. Uh, they arise from the, the casual cells, which are mesenchymal uh, cells that uh, work as a base maker for the, uh, for the intestine. And usually they also are diagnosed at the sixth decade uh, as uh, also men are affected more than women in this disease. The uh, clinical presentation, usually uh, they do present with more commonly with bleeding other, rather than uh, the, the, the other constitutional symptoms. They do have abdominal pain. They sometimes present with obstruction because of the nature of the tumor because it's usually tend to bulge in the lumen. The palpable mass has also been reported as presentation and the perforation happens what, which can be associated with, with good amount of bleeding. Um, sometimes when, uh, when they are uh, uh, symptomatic, they, they present with symptoms related to the, the, to the metastasis rather. The uh, nice uh, picture that you see in colonoscopy or endoscopy, if you're looking about also the just tumors of, of the stomach is usually characteristics. Very nice looking bulging tumor that is as if it's looking at you with bulging at the lumen with smooth you know, surface. And uh, when the suspicion is high and the, the clinical scenario is going with it, probably most of the endoscopics will, will shy off doing a biopsy uh, and they might depend on other, you know, modalities like radiology because they would like to avoid spillage of the tumor cells and also the bleeding that can happen with the destruction of the uh, pseudocapsule. Uh, the CT scan uh, is also associated with, with uh, characteristic lesion like large exophytic mass, inhomogeneous usually, and uh, Sometimes they present with the metastasis. One of the things that probably I just want to re remind you that uh, the CT scan in neuroendocrine tumors and in just tumors sometimes can be misleading because unless you do uh, an octreotide scan or any other nuclear scans, you might miss major, uh, major you know, metastasis of the, of the liver that cannot show in the, in the CT scan. So that's why we depend on the histopathology and uh, the, also the characteristic of the histopathology goes with spindle cell shaped, uh, shaped cells with the small nuclei and distinct cytoplasm uh, with the marker CK positivity, which is not very specific. However, though it is uh, sensitive, protein uh, kinase C and dog one is usually uh, quite sensitive. The uh, staging, as we said, also depends on the, uh, mainly on the, on the size and the mitotic activity. And the prognosis, uh, next slide, please. Based on the tumor mitotic rate, uh, small tumors, they usually do well and they can be resected easily. However, though, uh, anything that's less than uh, two uh, centimeters with less activity, uh, mitotic activity than five per 50 power field. Usually they are associated with, with good outcomes. Anything more than that usually is associated with poor outcome and also metastasis. Next, please. 
The treatment actually uh, uh, is also a multi-modality uh, approach, surgery, uh, chemotherapy with, with the new advancement of uh, using the, the uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, imitinib and san sanitinib has been a, a great uh, improvement in the treatment of these kind of rectal tumors. The goal of this uh, of the surgery is actually to remove the entire tumor and the pseudocapsule. Lymphadenectomy usually is not uh, granted, and we don't practice it in our center for, for these kinds of tumors. Uh, the size of the tumor usually plays an important role, like the segmental bowel resection uh, is most of the time is more than enough. The large tumors uh, or aggressive kind of tumors, they might go for more aggressive surgery like APR or even exenteration of the, of the pelvis. Uh, the size has been noticed that it plays a more important role than the margin itself. <clears throat> the new advancement or the, I mean, the, the introduction of, of imitinib uh, and sanitinib in the treatment of, of the, uh, these kinds of tumor made an important improvement on the, on the management because it does help the surgery very much. Uh, usually grants you uh, less aggressive surgery and uh, many times it can even preserve the sphincter if it's quite low tumor. The choice between a uh, new adjuvant uh, regimen with uh, imitinib uh, before or after the surgery has been under uh, heavy, uh, you, know, uh, you know, study. And up to now, we didn't come up with, with a specific kind of, of, uh, of regimen. However, though most of the time it ends up with, with the adjuvant uh, treatment. How long should the patient be on uh, omitinib? Up till now, we accept very widely the one year uh, regimen, uh, but I think eventually we, this might be changed with, with more, more you know, accumulation of cases. The prognosis usually is, although it's quite uh, uh, tempting to treat these cases and we think that they are easy, but unfortunately the metastases do happen quite early it affects the liver and you have, you know, uh, peritoneal metastasis quite easy. Uh, and even in very limited number of patients, they have bone and lung uh, metastasis. So in a nutshell, uh, just quickly to summarize what I said, I'm uh, gathering all this information quickly. Atypical rectal malignancies do happen, but they are quite rare. Uh, the presentation usually are non-specific. Uh, uh, it has to have some kind of high level of suspicion and can easily mimic much more common adenocarcinoma. Uh, that's the usual main stem of treatment for, for uh, uh, malignancy. The best, best approach usually is, in most of the cases, the individualization of cases and treating them according to uh, multidisciplinary approach. And the proper diagnosis is important uh, in the treatment options and also the outcomes. And that's all. Thank you very much. And sorry for uh, taking your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Yusuf Abdul Karim, for your informative and very comprehensive uh, presentation. I know now uh, we are really behind the schedule, but uh, I will just allow for two or three questions. I'll ask my colleagues, the panel member, Dr. Nadim Malibari, Dr. Ihab Ahmed, Professor uh, uh, Wissam Al Ghamri, to uh, to, uh, to have a few questions, two or three questions maximum, and to, uh, to lead the discussion for that. Thank you. So uh, yes. I saw you uh, uh, Yeah, Prof, go ahead, <laughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you very much for your both uh, presentations. They were uh, fruitful. And uh, as long as I am not a surgeon, I found them very interesting for me. Uh, my question is for uh, Dr. Hans. Uh, we know that uh, lymphoma is a systemic disease. So what do you think about the actual role of surgery as radical treatment if the lymphoma happens actually in the uh, rectum? Question goes to me. This goes to Yes, the question for you. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I know that the non logical lymphoma is a systemic disease actually from the start. What, what do you think about the actual role of surgery as a definitive treatment in uh, lymphoma when it hits the uh, rectum? Yeah, 
this uh, place only after a failure of uh, systemic uh, therapy, I think, and uh, with exceptions only for perhaps early uh, small cases, uh, which we uh, remove just for diagnostics and it's away then. But in all other cases, we would uh, um, send the patient at first to the medical oncologist and uh, only if uh, there, um, if he has problems and uh, the patient uh, tumor um, doesn't vanish from, from chemotherapy, then um, the surgery has its place, but mostly uh, in a palliative manner, I think, in these cases. Yes, we yes. Cannot uh, cure, so. We cannot cure a, a, a patient with a, a chemotherapy resistant uh, lymphoma. Okay. This is possible. Actually, actually, I'm seeing a nice debate between medical oncologists trying to push us to do a surgery for lymphoma and you, Professor Lerner, trying to convince our presenting the watch and see. Yeah. Actually, I, 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 I have been there once this Brazilian, famous Brazilian paper was published. It caused us a lot of debate just right now. We have a lot of patients with a complete clinical response after uh, upfront chemo and radiotherapy and they want just to keep it like this. We don't want to do operation because of this famous Brazilian paper. I know it was back from there from 15 years. And my question for you, I'm going, if I'm going to do this out of trial, how I'm going to follow up my patient and make sure that everything is okay and there is no recurrence. I'm talking about pathological recurrence. Yeah, uh, this you is should... Yeah, you should... This is a very... In, within trials, uh, it's better uh, today. Uh, it lacks uh, of data and uh, it's better to do it in trials. But if you uh, actually do it outside a trial, then you have to follow the patient really close. I would say... Um, uh, discomic biopsies? Discomic, every, you recommend discomic biopsies? Uh, biopsies are not really helpful. Uh, you need uh, pictures, you need a CT scan every uh, half a year, or MRI, and uh, perhaps uh, helpful could be um, uh, to do a PET scan. PET scan, um, PET scan. If, if, you, I, you, if, you I, if I had, a, I personally had a, a rectal cancer and had a, a TNT and had a complete remission, I wouldn't uh, go to the surgeon, but I would <laughs> watch this very closely and uh, would do, uh, in the first two years, I would do perhaps uh, three or four times a PET scan because the, the biopsy is, is only to see the scar uh, or uh, to see what is in the, uh, a, a scar, which is mostly there. Uh, but what is behind the scar, this is what is with the lymph nodes, uh, you can't say. And whether this scar is growing, you can see by rect rectoscopy. You should do this uh, uh, four times a year, I think, uh, looking directly on the scar. And if something changes, then uh, you can take a specimen. But, um, uh, but uh, just to cut the a small piece out of the scar gives no information about the rest of the scar. Therefore, it makes not much sense. Going back to the radicality of the surgery that you just presented about double stoma, I, we, we have just received a very nice, excellent question from one of our audience, Maelia Papa. She's asking about how you are going to prepare your patient psychologically if they are going to have this kind of body changes and changes their appearance. Uh, is there any special psychological preparation for, for your patient to prepare them for such kind of a change in their body? Dr. Hans? Yeah. It, most of these patients have uh, a special career uh, behind themselves and they seek help and um, they are really desperate. And because of the symptoms of the pain, of the future of and so on. And therefore, they are really thankful to get help. 
it's more difficult with those patients who uh, got a diagnosis of a recurrent rectal cancer without symptoms. And this is really difficult to discuss with them to say, you have to do really major surgery, maximum surgery to help you and to avoid uh, symptoms uh, which can come next month, next year, perhaps only in two or three years, um, but they will come. And those patients need really many, uh, many discussions, many talks, uh, and you have to, to communicate really close with them. But uh, now we haven't uh, specialized uh, um, psychologists for this. Because I think this is uh, a task for the surgeon. The surgeon, she's, is she's not, the surgeon is not somebody who only operates. The surgeon is a psychologist as well. She has she's, to be. The, Could be. The, the rest of her question, does this psychological issue affect the result of your operation? If you have one, a depressed one, patient after effect what? This, the results of your procedure your operation to have a depressed patient with a stoma after the operation this affects this will affect the, the overall result you are difficult to understand but uh, the, if, if you have it, a depressed patient if you uh, have a patient with depression after after he had he has he now he has a permanent stoma sometimes permanent double stoma thus yeah. does this uh, yani, a psychological depression might affect the overall result of the tumor and the procedure itself? Yeah, sure, sure. This is possible. Yeah, it's possible that, uh, therefore, uh, you even in surgery, 50%, I would say, or perhaps up to 50% is psychology. You heal patients during the ward rounds, not only in the operation yeah. <laughs> And uh, this, uh, if I may the... add uh, just one point, uh, Professor Pierre, I, I think uh, from our experience in, uh, in our community, uh, it, it's very important to be honest. If you're honest all the time and tell the patients all the possible scenarios, most of the time the patient will appreciate if it doesn't happen. So, you know, if the patient is going for, for you know, low anterior, very low anterior resection versus APR. And he ends up with, with, with preserving his sphincter and just a very low anterior resection, they will be very appreciative. As you said very rightly, surgeon should be a psychologist. The oncologist also has to be a psychologist and understand the patient. Make sure that everything is explained widely on the table before we go for surgery. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is what I think. Uh, I don't know what this modern uh, word of the shared decision making means. Uh, I think the final decision is always uh, the patient's decision. And uh, my task is to tell him uh, what the chances and risks are and what we are doing and what he has to face after the operation. And then uh, he can decide. Uh, I have to give him just the, the, the knowledge uh, and the information uh, to make him uh, able to decide uh, what to do. Uh, but I'm not a decision maker. I can offer something and tell him what I can offer. And then it's his decision what, what to do. There is, especially for those, uh, for primary rectal cancer, it's a different thing. But for recurrent rectal cancer, these extended operations, um, these uh, pelvic exenterations, sacral sections, there's not really an indication. It is a possibility. It is perhaps an offer, but uh, it is always a very, very individual decision. And which can- Thank you, excellent. And only excellent. by- Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think uh, we, it's 11 o'clock now in Saudi Arabia. I think we are coming to conclude this excellent webinar. Thank you very much to all participants. Thank you very much to our speakers, Prof. 